what the right wants to say is if you complicate things, you complicate history, for example, by saying, well, actually, maybe George Washington wasn't 100% a saint, you know, or if it's not 100% something, then you will lose it. That, you know, we'll, we'll lose all sense of our history and we won't have, we won't know who we are and we'll be just kind of wandering around in the dark. And the reality of human experience is that, you know, we're, we're, we're all perfectly capable of, because it's just human, isn't it? I mean, the people we love, I don't know about you, but I love lots of people and I don't think any of them are 100% saintly. And even more shocking, I think most of them would say the same about me, you know. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Fenton. Where we find you today? I'm in Princeton in New Jersey. I'm teaching here. So are you teaching theater or are you teaching, you know, democratic values? I have a fabulous title, which is um, professor of Irish letters. Ah. Letters is a really wonderful word. It's like an 18th century man right. of letters. <laughs> you know? So is that is that Yeats all the way to Brendan Behan? Is that everything? Uh, yeah, between? and also politics or history or Ah, whatever, yeah. whatever I fancy, really. While we're on the subject of Irish letters, which and then we'll segue into American disaster. What is it about I these writers coming out of Ireland? You mean the existential uh, dread, sorry. threat, gloom and doom? Has it always been gloom and doom? Is it the landscape? Is it the you know nature? What at all the politics? But what's what is it? And and exquisite writing. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? I mean, because there's no question. That even you know, I'm biased in Irish, so I, I would say it. But but it is disproportionate, you know, in terms of the impact on world literature. I think that it, the big thing is that sort of Irishness decenters everything. It, it's a place because of its peculiar mixture of geographical and cultural closeness to the world power, you know, which was which was of course Britain, the British Empire and distance from it and argument with it and, and you know, being colonized by it and all that. No one thing is ever true of Ireland, you know, so that it's both kind of part of white Europe and of the colonizing world. You know, if I was an indigenous Native American and all these Irish people were coming to displace me, I wouldn't feel, oh, you know, they're they're suffering. You know, <laughs> Or if I was an Aboriginal person in Australia, you know, where, where the Irish moved, I, I wouldn't feel much more sympathy for them. But at the same time, you know, it's a place where you had the deadliest famine proportionally in world history you had this enormous displacement so it's 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 just a very very fluid kind of space you know where where almost everything you say the opposite is also true and so i think just irish conditions create this sense of fluidity and strangeness and ambiguity that's great for writers you know i read democracy's afterlife which was just a a thing that you had written it wasn't a thing it well, was an incredible article yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sorry a thing is absolutely fine you say in their democracy you know let's say it's it's dying you know it's like you know we were talking before you came on priscilla and i you know she thinks that democracy is dying i wonder whether you know it's it, when you're inside a thing whether one can see what's really happening there have been times in the american experience where things have been bad before is yeah. this really a unique set of challenges that we're facing or will the long perspective sort of sort it out and it just be another phase in world history? You know? Yeah, I think there's a real danger, isn't there, in, in thinking, well, we've been through this before and it's been all right and therefore it'll be okay the next time. You know? yeah. I mean, I suppose what I would say is the paradox is that democracy thrives when it's most conscious of its own extreme fragility. You know, yes. so I don't know who was a, said something about, you know, nothing concentrates the mind more than the prospect of being hanged in the morning, you know, and yeah. if, if democracy is not aware of its own imminent death, it becomes complacent and stale and, and corrupt. If we don't think about it as a sort of daily struggle for survival and, and as a struggle that kind of needs every one of us, you know, that actually needs our active participation as citizens, then it will go, you know. We're all old enough to remember the hope of 1989, 1990, you know, the sense that actually the world had changed and democracy in our sense was going to become the kind of gold standard of the world. And I think there was an enormous complacency that that sort of set in around that. And I think it was a complacency around two things. I mean, one around can you have democracy with, without at least a progress towards economic equality? You know, I don't mean absolute equality, but but a sense that our feeling of belonging, as sh of shared belonging, has some kind of economic reality to it. And also, 
on the other side, the necessity for a democracy to be kind of constantly questioning itself, you know, that like that, that's really what democracy is, isn't it? It's an endless process of questioning. And, and we, if you get into the sort of mindset of institutionalized control, you know, where politics becomes a professional bureaucratic matter for people who, who make their life out of it, that can't survive. And, 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 I, th- I think both of those things have been coming. I think there's there's a price to be paid for having greater and greater economic inequality, and there's a price to be paid for having a kind of professionalization of politics as a matter for lobbyists and careerists and institutionalists, you know. And one of the things I really like about America, you know, when I, you know, coming here from Ireland from abroad and I spent a lot of time in America, but, you know, it's, there's an incredible vibrancy to civil society in America, you know. And maybe Americans take it for granted sometimes, but it's it's the one thing that really gives me enormous hope, you know, is, is Americans have this sense of involvement, you know, of, of wanting to be involved. And you see it, it, you know, disasters seem to bring out the best in Americans, you know, but you see incredible capacity to rally around, to help people to just get out and do something. The question is, why can't that translate itself, you know, into into higher politics, you know? But it it does give me a certain kind of hope in terms in terms of thinking, you know, this thing is not going to be dead so long as you still have that capacity there for for people to to feel that they can respond and that they can they can shape things. But they have to be able to feel that politically as well as in in ordinary kind of social engagement. I love that you said, you know, people need to understand it's a daily struggle, certainly this idea of democracy. But that also means you have to have an understanding of what democracy is or could be. Are there political divides where there's an inclination towards a vibrant, healthy civil society and discourse and critical thinking and pluralism and different ideas? And do we see that even within the United States or your observations? I mean, I would say, to just state the obvious, that you know, one of the, the great problems for the United States has always been to make democracy inclusive. So for a start, you know, to actually have a sense that it's not white democracy, you know, it's not Protestant democracy, it's not, you know, and that historically, you know, so many people have been excluded or marginalized or argued over as to whether or not they're entitled to full citizenship. You know, it, it, of, of course, that's particularly true of the descendants of slavery, but Native Americans, lots of immigrant groups, including the Irish in their time, you know, who are now a kind of very established mainstream American group, but they were despised immigrants once, you know, because they were Catholic, particularly, and they were poor and they were unskilled and uneducated you know they were they, they were out they were real outsiders at one point and so you've had this kind of continual process of trying to define who's us and to have a sense of America that's that's capacious enough to give everybody a sense of of, of of having an equal standing within it you know and I don't like being partisan about this but I do think a very particular thing happened to the Republican Party in this century you know and I think you can get a sense of it if you just go back to after Obama's second electoral win, you know, where the Republicans held what they called a post-mortem, I think is kind of an interesting sort of use of language, you know, that the, the body was dead. And there was a sense that the Republicans are no longer capable of winning a majority, you know, that they can't win the popular vote in a, in a presidential election. They could not really govern in a system of majority rule, you know, the basics of how democracy works. So a lot of the institutions of America for an outsider are just mind-blowing. I mean, I, I cannot understand the Senate. You know, I cannot understand how Vermont or Montana, you know, has the same power as California. You know, it just it just doesn't make sense. I can't understand the ways in which this is kind of allowed to drift and drift and drift further as the population comes more and more into cities and more and more in certain states. You know, this this disjunction between how people vote and where they vote and, and who gets to call the shots, you know, gets wider and wider. So so there, there, there are all those issues, but 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 the Republicans are realizing that the American system system gives you the possibility to hold power without the consent of the majority. Right. You know, and, and so so what they said out in, in the postmortem after Obama's second election was, you know, it was a, it was kind of pretty interesting documents and it's sort of, it was, you know, the great and the good of the Republican Party. And they all said, we have to change. If we're going to win a majority again, we have to change. And we have to change to become open and diverse and to, you know, speak much more directly to people of color, to women, you know, to sexual minorities, you know, it was actually a very good document, a very important democratic document in the with small D sense, you know, of this is our fault and we've got to change. And then there was a sense of, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to change because then we yeah. wouldn't be ourselves. So the only thing you can do then in, in those circumstances is to think about how do you rule without a majority, which means that you have to be anti-democratic. Right. You have to exploit all the weaknesses in the American constitutional system, which allow the Senate to block the will of the majority of what people have voted for. You have to exploit the weakness of the politicization of the judiciary, you know, to 
to really let's capture the judiciary because that's not democratically elected and you can have enormous power through and of course all the bits of the Supreme Court and you have to attack voting rights and you have to try to stop people voting because the more people vote I mean Trump's one of Trump's virtues <laughs> there weren't very many of them but he said it out loud you know he said well, sure, if everybody voted we never get elected you know the Republicans wouldn't win anything so what, what, why would we encourage people to vote and so it's it has reached a point of being an anti-democratic democratic party you know that 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 great paradox and I think this is deeply, deeply alarming because you do need, particularly if you've only got a two-party system, I mean, lots of European countries have five and six-party systems, you know, but if you've only got a two-party system, you cannot afford one of those parties to have this antipathy to some of the basics of democracy, you know? And this is not saying that the Democrats are perfect Democrats or, you know, that they have not been enthralled to, you know, interest groups and lobbyists and money and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, there's huge um, critiques of us Democrats and so on. But I think there is a basic difference between a political party that wants people to vote and one that doesn't, you know. Yeah. And we we saw in the you know in the Trump's attempted coup, I think America was just saved by the skin of its teeth by the existence of decent Republicans, you know, at state level who said no, we're counting the votes. And you know, it, it, this should not be the case, right? But, but why is it not alarming to some? So the, so yes, we're all here. I'm alarmed. Jesse is alarmed. You're alarmed. Like. Why this to me is the question. There's a lot of people, probably half the country, that did not think there's anything wrong with what's yeah. happening. Yeah. So that is the problem. And so is that an education problem? Is that system like how do you solve for that problem? Because like you said, it's we're perilously close to the end of something. Well, are, of- are we perilously close to the end of something? Well, I suppose it feels like you you could be. I mean, the things that would have seemed utterly ridiculous five, six years ago, you know, or have, have happened. You know? It doesn't and mean they're not still ridiculous, though, you know. It doesn't. Absolutely, it doesn't. But, but, you know, Trump did attempt to stage a coup. I mean, you know, the American president really yeah. tried to set aside an election and put enormous pressure, you know, on his own vice president, for example, not to search for the election. I mean, he's um, still calling it. Jesse, still he's calling it. Yeah, yeah, they're still but, claiming but, this. You know? But, you know, what, what about, you know, do we see, you know, some of this same issues in Brexit where it's like you basically have a country tearing itself apart? Ultimately, who did be- Brexit benefit in the end, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think there's a fundamental, well, they're, they're kind of related problems, aren't there? So, so, so one is the perception of a lot of people that they're losing out. You know, people who feel they've had status of some kind and they feel they're losing out. And then they cease to be committed to democracy, right? There is a particular American problem around a white majority which sees its status as a majority and as a privileged majority ebbing away demographically. And Brexit kind of fed on some of the same same thing, you know, which is a sort of toxic nostalgia. You know, we, we tend to think of nostalgia as a nice, warm thing, but nostalgia can become very, very toxic if it's about there was a world where I, particularly as a white man, had a, a lot of privilege. And this is not just a ruling class thing. I mean, you know, a lot of working class people felt, well, okay, I have a good life. I have a standing in, in society, in the community with my family. I'm a breadwinner. I, you know, I'm a member of a trade union or whatever. I have all this kind of stuff going for me. And if you see that ebbing away, I think you're, I think you're, you know, understandably in a way kind of very vulnerable to this appeal. And then that's on the one side. On the other side of it, you have, I think one of the things that's common in America and in Britain is a kind of anarchic ruling class, you know, complete paradox, you know, contradiction in terms, but where you get these reckless ruling classes, you know, where, where they're different in one way. But in America, I think it's because of the Tea Party stuff and all that, you know, the, the realization that actually... You can't lose by by going low and then lower and lower and lower and you know appealing more and more to to the base and to nasty instincts and and then in Britain I think you had a kind of there's an extra factor there which is a historical ruling class that was a world ruling class a world power you know empire and all that stuff and what does it do when it no longer has all of that it can either settle down and think great we're in, we're a modern normal country you know what's wrong with being normal but the thing that both america and britain have in common is this sort of obsession with greatness and greatness it, it sounds like a lovely thing but actually it's a it's it's really toxic you know because it means you can't be like everybody else and this sort of exceptionalism then kicks in and that what happened with brexit you know the sense that it's not good enough for britain to be equal to germany and france and italy and spain that's that's an insult to us we, we, we've always been better than that we've always been the the power you know and i think you get the mixture of these things you know where, where that kind of produces this this ruling class that sort of plays these games and and has no sense of responsibility long-term responsibility you know it's just about getting into power these years on you know does do people look at brexit as a as a success if you're 
from that part of the world? I mean, it's 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 really bizarre. You know, like the stuff that people like me said would happen, and we were told, "Oh, come on, you're, that's absolutely ridiculous." It's all happening. I mean, there are empty shelves in the shops. You know, right. <laughs> they can't get truck drivers. It's a simple level, right? Because you know, well, there's the COVID is obviously a factor as well, and I think this is one of the things that's kind of saving Boris Johnson is that it's mixed up in people's heads as to what part of this is the responsibility of the pandemic and what part of it is the responsibility of Brexit. And it's genuinely hard to disentangle these things, right? There isn't in, in the real world. But you know, you, you, there's no truck drivers because most of the truck drivers were from from European countries, and they're very much in demand, and they don't they don't feel they don't feel welcome. You know, that this kind of xenophobia really does get to people, actually. It really does feel, well, okay, if you don't want me here, I, I, I have choices, I can go somewhere else. But also, if you were a truck driver, it's not really well paid. It's it's a pretty awful job. And then you're expected to be a customs expert at the same time. So it's bad enough, like, I have to drive this load of fish from here to here, you know. <laughs> right. But like to say, I mean, you're like, with a load of fish, like, you, you might literally be talking about 70 documents. Right, wow. And if there's one thing wrong with one of those documents, you know, I said, no, you can't, you know, and you have to sit there and wait, or, you know, it's horrible. And so just people just feel, I'm not being paid to be this this person, you know. Right. So so a lot of that stuff is actually happening. But what's happened in Britain is very like what's happened. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say Britain. It's really England, you know. So it's, right. it's not really so much in Scotland, Wales, or around, but in, in England, it's 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 quite like America in that it's very tribal. So just as politics in the United States has become us against them. Political scientists looking at Britain are saying it's not no longer like it used to be Labour and Conservative. It's now Leave and Remainer. You know, it's it's how did you vote on Brexit has become a sort of new tribal divide. And lots of other stuff feeds into that in very similar to the, to the US, you know, levels of education, how you perceive yourself in terms of opportunity, all those kind of things feed into it. But once it becomes tribal, people become incredibly forgiving of complete screw ups. You know, so, you know, when when Trump said I could walk out on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and, you know, my base wouldn't care. He was right. You know, it turned out he's absolutely right. This is why the impeachments, for example, this has made no difference. And and Johnson has something of the same kind of immunity, you know, that that you you hear, you listen to his own supporters talking about him, you know, he's completely reckless and irresponsible and not really fit to govern, but he's great fun. And after all, he's at Brexit. So it's like, um, and that's dangerous too for democracy because democracy is about accountability, isn't it? Ultimately, it's about, you know, what's the difference in a democratic system? It's not just people who vote, but it's also that people who hold power have to account for how they're using it. And I think this tribalization is great for ruling elites because it, it means that actually they're not accountable they can do what they like they can fail in all sorts of ways and their voters will just say well he's my guy you know and it usually is a he um, yeah. and that's okay what accounts for though this trend i'm not going to call it a trend but maybe it is why you know why do you think it's all happening now because this is before the pandemic it's not like what is why is i mean is it a, is it the end of is, a post uh, world war ii sort of uh, generation and and uh, we forgot how difficult those the, those wars were I think I think I would absolutely agree with that as a fundamental to all of this you know which is that democracy was rebuilt after the catastrophes of the second world war because you had a, well first of all you had a challenge you had communism and you, you say you know you said well actually whatever that is we have to do something different and it has to be obviously better you know <laughs> which means that it has to be accountable and open and have you know so I'm not saying it always was but at least have to have really kind of fundamental principles about we behave ourselves in a different way to the way an autocracy behaves but also just the sense of fragility that that generation had you know that this this thing can go disastrously wrong you know if it happens in germany which was arguably you know the most civilized advanced country in the world you know it can go wrong anywhere and and there are no assumptions we can make that are permanent if we don't fight for the thing but also if 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 people don't have a stake in it you know like the, the disasters of the the, the 19 19- 30s came from the Great Depression and the fact that you had large numbers of people who felt they hadn't got a stake in society anymore. I think that's absolutely one of the kind of long-term forces as to why this, this came to a head when it did. And then I think you can't rule out both the, the banking collapse and the and the responses to the banking, the great banking disaster. The, the way in which governments dealt with that, I think, was really, really serious. I mean, loading all that debt onto ordinary taxpayers, I think, I think had a really serious effect in terms of saying government is not for us. It's 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 for, you know, it makes it very credible to talk about the elites and all that kind of very populist kind of talk. A third factor is actually quite positive, which is, and again, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna-ish, you know, about everything is great, but 
some of this is, you know, a response to things which are really good, <laughs> which is the discourse has changed around LGBTQ people, for example. There's been a backlash against the backlash against feminism, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the, the, the sort of, this is the third or fourth wave, I don't know, whatever it is of feminism, but, you know, and the Me Too movement, all that is part of that, you know. Of course, Black Lives Matter, the, the movement for, for racial justice, you know, th there is a challenge to the, the orthodoxies, you know, and some of it is a kind of vicious response to that, you know, how, how do you deal with those, those kinds of um, challenges? So is it sort of the peoples representing lots from different ethnicities, gender identity, saying this no more, like, no, this isn't okay anymore? Is it, is that part of really, or, and leaning into a, a kind of a way that countries have been ruled for a very, very long time and people are saying, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Is that sort of what happens and what accounts for, is it Southern Ireland becoming so progressive? Yeah. I mean, it's it's really fascinating to have been through all that, you know, through, through a place that was very, very, I mean, America looks to me like it's, well, at least for, for some Republicans, it's on the road to theocracy, you know, this is, this is the, the state that people would like to <laughs> arrive at, you know, where the foundational principle of, you know, go back to the Virginia statutes of, you know, Thomas Jefferson, the, the separation of church and state, you know, as a, as a really fundamental principle of human freedom, you know, and actually a freedom of religion. I mean, religion can't be free if it's tied up with 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 politics and the state, you know, uh, that was so fundamental. And But I lived in something that was kind of a bit like a theocracy. It wasn't quite, but it was pretty close. Catholic Church was the, by far the biggest power in the land when, when I was born and probably for the first 40 years of my life. And People have to struggle to 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 overthrow these things. You know, it doesn't happen by by chance. Very very brave women. You know, get gay people beginning to speak out, identify themselves. A, a lot of this really just happens with people saying, "Hold on a minute, I'm here. I'm a real person." You know, because <laughs> of course all these systems are so fundamentally hypocritical. You know, they make claims about themselves. You know, in terms of their purity and of being better than everybody else and being exceptional. And you know, and 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 of course they become corrupt because they have too much power. You know, I know it's an awful cliche, but absolute power does corrupt, absolutely. And we saw that with the Catholic Church in Ireland, which is one of the most powerful institutions of its kind anywhere in the world. You know, it had absolute control over public discourse, over people's minds, and a lot of temporal power. And it's it collapsed within 10 years. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just gone as a, as a political institution. By the way, there's nothing to do with religion. It's nothing to do with actual religious belief, you know, which I respect hugely. But as a temporal institution, an institution of power, it went. And yeah, I mean, it went because people challenged it and and it, it took a lot of courage for a lot of people to challenge these these consensuses you know and i think the same thing has happened in in america you know it's happened happened around the world but institutions will fight back you know power structures will will fight back and they'll 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 use any methods at their disposal and this kind of right-wing populism is a very a very powerful tool you know which is to say forget about that stuff you know let's think about you know what makes you superior to other people let's think about our exceptionalism, our ethnicity, you know, our privileged place in the world and all these people who are threatening it, you know, immigrants and, you know, whatever, you know, you can, you can, you can pick your enemies. I always remember seeing a play that ended up something to be saying, you know, we knew it was us and them. It was about a community in New York, I think, but an Irish community in New York. I said, we knew it was us and them. We knew who they were. We just didn't know who the F we were. <laughs> and I think that's the key thing, you know, is, it's very, very easy to say that, you know, we're not them and very hard to say what's the us. But if you can't articulate an us, which is generous and open and and has a, a real sense of equality at its heart, then I think you you, you hand those weapons to the people who, who, who want to divide us on these kind of tribal lines. Is it something to say that we don't know ourselves? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, I write this book about Ireland, about it was called We Don't Know Ourselves. And, you know, I, I, I was trying to deal with cognitive dissonance, I suppose. You know, Donald Rumsfeld, late Donald Rumsfeld famously talked about, you know, known, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And, unknowns. and he left out the one I think that's kind of most interesting, which is the the, the unknown unknown. The thing that everybody knows that that is also manages to be unknown, you know. And in Ireland, this was like child abuse by the Catholic Church, for example, which so many of us were really conscious of because it was happening in front of our eyes, you know, as kids, and, you know, and in America, I think it's, I think, well, it really struck me when I came to America first in the 1990s, you know, there's, it, there's the issue of race, you know, the, the legacy of slavery, which is just so in your face, you know, and very, very obvious to everybody. And yet at the same time, you could manage not to know it somehow, you know, it could, it could, it could remain out there on the margin. 
it's sort of like listening to Clancy Brothers. You can know it, but you can <laughs> never really know it. Yes, 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 yes. There's a difference between knowing something and acknowledging it. You know, and acknowledgement is a public collective process, you know, where, whereby we accept all of our history and all of our identity in, you know, in all of its complexities and, and ambiguities. And I'm sort of optimist, actually, because I think one of the funny things about our particular moments in history is that although politically these forces are very, very adept and very successful at the moment of sectionalizing and tribalizing and saying you have to be one thing or the other, you can't be both. Actually, if you look at real life, I think, you know, overwhelmingly people are increasingly comfortable with with multiple identities you know with a sense of belonging which is which is much more capacious you know we live our lives with with lots and lots of senses of who we are and how we connect with other people and and, and they're not in conflict with each other we can seemingly add an almost infinite number of them you know without going crazy and and what the right wants to say is if you complicate things you complicate history for example by saying well actually maybe George Washington wasn't 100% a saint, you know, or if it's not 100% something, th then you will lose it. That, you know, we'll, we'll lose all sense of our history and we won't have, we won't know who we are and we'll be just kind of wandering around in the dark. And the reality of human experience is that, you know, we're, we're, we're all perfectly capable of, because it's just human, isn't it? I mean, the people we love, I don't know about you, but I love lots of people and I don't think any of them are 100% saintly. And even more shocking, I think most of them would say the same about me, you know, <laughs> and we're perfectly capable of having really, really healthy, warm, loving relationships while knowing little parts of our mind that actually not everything is perfect or that things are complicated or there are ambiguities. I think, you know, if you look at one of the great things that happens in, our, in human history of the last 20 years is more and more people have been able to say who they are. You know, if you remember that you know, when, when Barack Obama ran for the first time for the presidency, he ran against gay marriage. I, I don't know if you remember, but there was a moment in that election when Joe Biden said on a, one of the morning, uh, Sunday morning shows, I think he said he was in favor of gay marriage. And this was treated as a gaffe. I, I remember, you know, there was all this kind of narrative about Biden was always putting his foot in it and saying stupid things. And the, the entire narrative around Biden saying, you know, actually, it was very good for human dignity if, if, if people of the same sex could, could have the right to marry. It was, oh, another Joe Biden gaffe, you know. Yeah. And, and, and even seven or eight years later, like, you know, the discourse around that had changed so fundamentally. And in my country, you know, in Ireland, like where, where I mean, homosexuality was illegal. I mean, the laws under which Oscar Wilde was sent to prison were still in place in Ireland in the 1990s, the early 1990s. And yet, like just a couple of years ago, Ireland became the first country in the world to create same-sex equal marriage by popular vote. I mean, it, it happens either by, you know, legislatures or by courts doing it, but we had to have a referendum. I mean, an actual popular vote, because that's the way our constitution works. And, you know, it was like 66% of Irish people voted for, for equal marriage, you know? So I think we can some, sometimes get too depressed and say, you know, everything has gone in one direction, which is, which is downhill. I think there are also kind of extraordinary kind of democratic changes which have been taking place underneath all of that and, and as part of it. And actually give, given a choice and given a chance, most people are still pretty decent. You know, if things are put to them in human terms, you know, what happened in Ireland was that the way that discourse just changed was, people coming out, I mean, literally coming out and saying, but hold on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lesbian. I'm, I'm in love with this woman and we want to have a child. Oh, but, oh, you, oh yeah, but yeah, like, you're my neighbor. You're, you know, you're the one who works with my sister. You're, you know, you're a person suddenly. Whereas before, you know, and what all these systems try to do is to demonize and dehumanize people. And you're, you're a kind of, you're a category. Um, that's a, that's a threat and a danger. And, and, and once, once people see other people as human beings, actually the decency, is still there i think <laughs> and the, the challenge is how do we how do we translate that into into political institutions you know when you read something like uh, borstel boy you know brennan behan's great uh book do you look at look back at that as almost a romanticism of a a certain period you know because talking about prison in that book and you know that doesn't resemble prison now right like prison now is a dark terrible force he went there almost yeah. like it was he was visiting his friends you know yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned Borsal Vogue because I, I think it's a great book and it's, it's been kind of a little bit forgotten, you know, I don't know if people know it, but it's it, Brendan Bean, the Irish playwright, it's, it's an autobiographical book about the time that he spent in a reform prison in, in England. And I mean, this guy was a terrorist. I mean, that, that's, you know, like it's, it's an extraordinary story because he, he was a child terrorist. He went over to plant bombs in England for the IRA 
at the beginning of the Second World War, when God loved them, the English had enough problems, right? They were being bombed by the Luftwaffe. You know, they didn't really need a kid going over to try to blow people up. And fortunately, he was arrested, you know, and, and the thing that really screwed him up, right? So he was a classic kind of, I hate these people, I'm going to kill them, you know. And the thing that really screwed him up is that he was actually treated with, you know, decency and kindness, you know. He was very lucky. If he'd been a bit older, he might have been hanged. You know, this was wartime and, you know, he, it was a capital offence. But because he was 16, they, they sent him to a kind of reform school, to, you know. And then what really screwed him up was he fell in love with an English guy. You have to read between the lines a little bit in the book because it was of its time. But it's very clear that, you know, this is a kind of love relationship. He, he, he really falls for this guy and, and it's mutual and it's a beautiful relationship. And, it, and you know, it's, but it's this idea of I have these political ideas in my head, which are very destructive and violent. And then... They really kind of mess, mess me up by not being the caricature I had of them and, and by treating me with some decency, but also then this kind of intimacy of, of connection and love and, and, and a relationship that's formed. And I think that's why it's such a fascinating book, you know, because, because it, 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 it has these two things going on at the same time, the big politics of it and then this kind of intimate relationship. And it really raises for us, I think, those, those big questions about why are we capable of extraordinary kind of compassion and generosity and openness in our personal lives and you know in, in the way we relate to each other while at the same time being capable of quickly dehumanizing people right so so this is a guy who on one level would have put a bomb in a pub to blow up you know somebody and on the other level can fall in love with them you know and that complexity i think that he gets i mean i again it's very shocking coming from outside into america just how punitive american society is you know and I don't know whether this comes from a Wild West culture or something, you know, but this lust for locking people up, for throwing away the key, for dehumanizing people. God knows, I'm not saying prisons are nice places in Europe, but but some of the prison conditions in the United States, I mean, you know, would be regarded as human rights abuses um, on a, on a lar very large scale in, in, in most of Europe. That fed into, I suppose, the response to 9-11, you know, let's go and punish somebody whether or not they're guilty, you know. Guantanamo and then let's go to Iraq and punish somebody else there you know this sort of idea of retribution which is is not unreasonable in, in terms of 9-11 you know I, I, I absolutely understand the the desire for vengeance and the desire for some kind of order to be reimposed but it it, it becomes toxic because it, it it has no purpose in the end it has no point you know you, you you end up punishing people who are not guilty and then you get stuck in it then we saw this kind of whole tragedy of the last 20 years in Afghanistan you know where, where there's no there's no end end goal there's no there's no real sense of what are we doing here you know what's what's the purpose of this we started out with something and then we ended up with something completely different and then the end it just all collapses you know and, and the waste involved in this, the waste of American invention and energy and, and patriotism. You know, I, I, you know, so many people who would have joined up after 9-11, for example, into the armed forces, you know, did so out of pure love for their fellow human beings and wanting to, to you know, do good. And, and, and so much of that gets kind of distorted and wasted. So it's not so much that there were different eras around this. I, 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 I just think that one of the reasons why we have to keep reading and keep encountering art and you know creativity is that that's the area in which we're reminded all the time of just how 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 wonderfully complex human beings are you know and we cannot have a democracy if you don't accept complexity you know and and if you don't read and you don't encounter art and you don't watch movies and you don't you know go to the theater or whatever you know the diff i'm not saying there's all sorts of different forms in which people can encounter this but that's that's really what artists give us you know isn't it that 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 sense that actually real life is slippery and complex and and it's not a bad thing it's not something you have to run away from and hide in these kind of ridiculous simplicities you know it, w w once we make the world binary we start to kill it, sometimes literally. So, Fintan, you have given us so much to think about, but most importantly, you have the slightly optimistic, my favorite phrase. You're slightly <laughs> optimistic. Jesse's absolutely optimistic. I'm totally pessimistic. Yeah. Um, but no, with a little bit of optimism. But I think someday maybe you'll come back again because I, my roots were in the theater. So someday I'd love to talk to you about about theater and its relationship to, you know, politics. And, and, and I love that we're ending with people, don't forget to read, watch, go to plays, you know, you yeah. go and see things that where artists are showing us things that allow for a little bit of imperfection, because that's really, that's really what we're talking about and not to be such an ideologue that we have to allow for shades of gray. I hate to say that, 
but that is what we're talking about. Yeah, thank, you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so pleasure. much for being here with us. It really, really was a pleasure. Well, it was a joy for me. I'm, I'm really, really lovely to talk to you both.